Hello, this is uh, chapter one for employment law. And in this chapter one, we'll be dealing with an overview of employment law. We'll also be looking at the legal system, some legal concepts, and for those who have taken a business law course before, such as B-Law 3100, uh, some topics that will be discussed in this chapter will be a review for them. So the objectives of chapter one will be to look at the main, the three main sources of employment law and also examine jurisdiction. Uh, jurisdiction meaning uh, authority over employment law and then look at uh, the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms that is entrenched in Canadian Constitution. And then just briefly look at some key employment uh, statutes, uh, not only in BC, but also uh, related to the federal government. And uh, we'll end the chapter looking at the judicial and administrative systems and I'll just refer uh, where we can find uh, statutes, case law that may be relevant not only for this course but for any law course or even um, any law research you want to make uh, in the future. So let's start looking at some sources of employment law. Uh, I told you they are uh, three main sources. And the first one will be statute law. So statute comes from law that is passed by the legislative uh, branch, legislative power. In the federal government, the legislative power, the, le the legislative branch, is the parliament and in the province level the legislative branch is called legislature so whenever we refer to an act or to a statute we know that those laws were passed by either the parliament in the federal level or the legislature in the provincial level Examples here would be the Canada Labor Code, uh, so passed by the Parliament, federal level, or the BC Human Rights Code. This one passed by the legislature, uh, BC Provincial Legislature. We also have the Employment Standards Act, which is another example of uh, statute law passed by the provincial legislature. Another source will be constitutional law, uh, mainly the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms that is entrenched in the Constitution. And constitutional law is relevant for any fields of law, any topics of law. Why? Because constitutional law in Canada and in many other countries is the supreme law, is the law that has always to be respected so if laws below the constitution such as statute law or case law so if other laws do not comply do not respect the constitutional law such a law may be declared as illegal so we'll look briefly at um, some topics of the canadian charter of rights because they are relevant for employment uh, relationships. And the third uh, source of employment law will be common law. And when I say common law, I'm actually talking about, I'm referring to written decisions of the judges. So whenever judges uh, make a written decision, that decision becomes law. Not all decisions, but most decisions. So whenever we are making a petition to court uh, to claim a right, uh, 
uh, that we believe we have. So we will uh, write in our petition uh, where our right comes from. Our right may come from any statute law, may also come from constitutional law, and may also uh, come from past decisions, written decisions that dealt with a similar situation uh, that we faced. So we want to refer uh, such written decision uh, to help uh, solidify or justify our petition, our claim uh, to that court, to that uh, judge. So the three main sources here, again, statute law, it is, this is written law, this is law that is passed by the legislative power, either parliament, federal level, or legislature, provincial level. We have the Constitution of Canada and the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms is entrenched, is within the Constitution of Canada. Um, so they are also a source of law and common law, uh, which may, may also be understood as written decisions of judges or justices. And all of those will be detailed uh, from now on. So how is, very briefly, how is a statute law made? Uh, they are made via a public bill, uh, meaning that the cabinet will send a, a bill, a proposal, a draft of a law uh, or a draft that they want to become law, they want it to be law. And this draft, when it is in the legislative power, either parliament or the legislature, they are called public bills. And then uh, those bills, they will be read uh, basically three times. So there will be the first reading, there will be a second reading, and then a, a third reading. Usually in the third reading, so after discussions, af after changes that may have taken in uh, either the first or second reading based on um, the discussions, uh, in the third reading, there's usually a final vote. And then once it is um, voted and approved, it will only become law after the lieutenant governor signs that uh, bill. So upon signature of the lieutenant governor, the approved bill then becomes a statute, then becomes uh, an act and becomes valid law. Um, a law is usually valid uh, from the day it is published in the governmental uh, gazette, or if the law itself uh, reads or determines a specific date, it will become valid. So if there's no date in the law itself, then it is valid from the date it is published in the government uh, gazette. If there's a date, sometimes they say, oh, from uh, this law comes into force on January 1st. So then it is only valid on and after January 1st, okay? Uh, so we need to look at the law uh, to uh, learn whether that law, that statute, that act, is actually in effect or not, in case we are in doubt. So that's basically how a law is made, how a law is passed by the legislature, by, uh, sorry, by the legislative uh, branch, either parliament or the legislature uh, in the province. Uh, there are also private bills and uh, private members' bills, but this you may read uh, for your information. We don't. Uh, put much uh, attention to this. Okay, so we need to uh, detail a little bit this, uh, a little bit statute law. And I told you that statute law may be acts or 
uh, a statute, as it is called. So statutes, they will have, or the acts, they will contain the main requirements of the law. They may contain the main, they contain the main substance of the law. Uh, let me give you an example here. So if we, if we take the example of the Immigration Act, the Immigration Act, uh, among all their uh, paragraphs and uh, sections, will say that um, f foreigners who are enrolled in a full-time program in uh, Canada are allowed to uh, work up to 20 hours off campus. So that's the main act. That is the substance of the law. And this substance, it is in an act or in a statute. And then we have the regulations. We have several regulations. So we may have immigration regulation number uh, 234. I'm just thinking out loud a number. But just to exemplify that, a, a regulation will contain the detailed requirement. So a regulation will say, for example, how a foreign student that is enrolled in a full-time uh, program can apply, if needed be, can apply for a work per permit, for example. So regulations, they are more, not only, but more related to procedure. They are more procedural law. Whereas statutes, or also acts, they are more substantive law they talk more about the main rights the main substance of the law another aspect is that uh, statutes or acts as i uh, just told you they are passed by the parliament or the legislature so there's the first second third reading it takes some time it takes uh, it costs not only time, but also discussions, debates, negotiations, etc. Whereas regulations, as long as the statutes permit, the regulations, they are made by the executive branch, the prime minister and the cabinet, or the premier, or the ministers in the province. So the regulations, they are easily uh, made easily changed because they don't require um, the legislative process as we just saw okay so that's an important uh, distinction between statutes uh, or acts uh, versus uh, regulations and all written law whether we call them statutes or acts or regulations they may also be called uh, together as legislation okay so legislation in other words will be the general word for uh, written law for statutes for acts uh, and for uh, regulations uh, moving on so we now look at jurisdiction and interpretation uh, well first of all who interprets uh, legislation in general uh, judges and also uh, members of administrative tribunals. We'll look at administrative tribunals uh, a little later. But those members who are the adjudicators, the ones that take decisions, the ones that uh, make decisions, uh, they will interpret the legislation. Judges will also interpret the legislation. So you believe you are entitled to uh, overtime uh, pay and then you uh, file a complaint and you bring evidence saying that you have worked uh, more than 8 hours uh, per day or more than 40 hours per week and you are not paid overtime and you will also refer to the legislation to Employment Standards Act for example um, to substantiate your claim uh, with regards to your entitlement to overtime pay. So 
the administrative tribunal adjudicator or a judge, they will interpret this section of the Employment Standards Act uh, with regards to overtime pay, and they will render a decision to your complaint. They will, they will either grant uh, your complaint or they will deny uh, your complaint. Okay, so those are the ones who interpret uh, the legislation. They also interpret the constitution. They also interpret uh, written case law. So they will interpret all sources of law uh, in any given situation. And they will be interpreting this legislation as per case-by-case uh, -case basis. In terms of jurisdiction, what is jurisdiction? Jurisdiction is, is, um, should also be understood as authority. So who has authority to interpret a legislation, but also to render a decision? So if we file a lawsuit in court, the judge has the authority to interpret the legislation and to render a decision. If we file a complaint uh, to an administrative tribunal, it will be the member, the adjudicator, or the decision maker of that administrative tribunal who will have authority, power, to, to either, to both interpret legislation and to uh, render a decision. And this authority, uh, where do we find who has authority, who has jurisdiction? So we will find it in the legislation. The legislation could be acts, could be statutes, could also be regulations. Not much because regulations, they are more of procedural nature, as I told you, but could be. There could be uh, uh, circumstances, but mainly statutes and act, they will give authority, power to a specific person, to a specific position uh, to interpret legislation and to render a decision. Okay, so for example, if you uh, work in BC, if you work for a provincially regulated company, let's say you work for Tim Hortons. And you want to file a complaint. So because you work in BC, Tim Hortons is provincially regulated. And we'll see this in the future. Who is provincially regulated, who is uh, federally regulated. But let's um, consider. You are provincially regulated. You work in BC. So where do you file your complaint? Well, you will file your complaint in BC in the employment uh, branch or the employment tribunal in BC because you are located here. And this is what the Employment Standards Act says. Uh, employees working in BC will file their complaint in BC. Okay, uh, so this is jurisdiction. It is the authority, who has authority, what tribunal or court has authority, has power, to uh, receive your complaint or your lawsuit and then render a decision by interpreting the legislation, uh, case law, etc. And sometimes several statutes will apply to a single situation. So there may, there may be a case uh, in which a, let's say, federal, uh, federal statute applies uh, and also a provincial uh, statute applies as well. Uh, could be cases related to employment and human rights or employment and privacy. So those are just uh, two uh, random examples. But there may be circumstances in which we would need to look at different statutes to learn who has jurisdiction. Uh, in other words, where to file either a complaint or the lawsuit uh, and who will have the power, the authority uh, to render that decision. Uh, moving on, we look at uh, some rules for interpretation. So how do 
those people interpret the legislation, either the judges or the decision makers in administrative tribunals. So uh, one way is using the mischief rule if they need to. Uh, and the mischief rule talks about uh, the problem that the statute originally intended to address. So you may agree that the Employment Standards Act, uh, there, uh, the problem it intended to address was employment relationships. So how do employers and employees uh, interact, get along with one another? Uh, what uh, rights applies to both employers and employees? What are the minimum standards, etc.? So that's uh, the mischief rule in terms of uh, interpreting uh, statutes. Uh, those decision makers will also make use of internal aids uh, whenever needed. So they may look at the statute itself, uh, at the preamble of the statute, and see what the preamble says. So let's say, uh, considering uh, the uh, growth of cases of uh, COVID-19, uh, considering the need to protect Canadian population, etc., 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 the uh, borders will be closed for 30 days. So this is an example of a preamble. Uh, sometimes the preamble also, uh, not, not the preamble, uh, sorry, but sometimes uh, Section 1 uh, of an Act or Section 2, sometimes even in the end of the Act or Statute, there is a definition section. So the example here will be, uh, in this statute, the following words will have uh, the following definitions. So date will be only a business uh, day. Uh, any other uh, words, uh, they, they find important uh, to define so that whenever uh, decision makers need uh, to rely on the definitions, they don't need to look anywhere else, but they can they, they can look, they must look actually, in the statute itself, itself because the statute will have uh, a definition section. And another way to interpret legislation uh, will be through external aids. So what are scholarly uh, scholars are saying? about that statute or about a specific session in a statute. Uh, there may be research, there may be uh, people who have been studying that topic for a long time, so those uh, PhDs, etc. So whenever needed, uh, decision makers may also uh, make use of uh, scholarly articles and even dictionaries. Uh, sometimes a definition of a dictionary uh, may help uh, solve a dispute. Okay, so those are uh, ways, uh, the main ways uh, legislation is interpreted. Uh, moving on, so we, we look at a little bit of the structure, how, how Canada is structured. So Canada became independent in 1867 uh, due to the Constitution Act of uh, 19, 1867. At that time, it was called the BNAAA, uh, uh, the British North America Act, but it is currently called the Constitution Act of 1867. So in that act, uh, Canada was formed uh, with a federal government, a central government, plus uh, several provinces with provincial government as well. So in other words, uh, there was uh, provinces in Canada, they joined together to make a country and they surrendered a part of their power, so there was a partial power uh, surrender to the federal government. 
what I mean here is, um, let me give you this example. Uh, criminal law, criminal law, in um, in essence, can only be passed by the federal government. So provinces, they said, okay, we agree not to deal with criminal law. What is a crime? What is not a crime? Will be under the federal government responsibility. Whereas health, uh, health, healthcare was determined to be an exclusive power of the provincial government. So the provincial government said, well, but we want to keep our exclusive power for health, uh, healthcare, for example. There are other uh, fields, other uh, topics that are either under the exclusive, exclusive power of the federal government or the provincial government. But I just exemplified those two to um, help uh, explain how Canada was formed. So Canada was formed as a country. So it has a central government, a federal government. The federal government has some exclusive powers. But Canada was uh, Canada is a um, a number of provinces put together in which some power was kept exclusive of the provinces. Okay, so provinces also have uh, their exclusive power. If we want to compare this with the United States, uh, similar. Uh, mechanism or similar uh, rationale so in the united states there's a federal government it deals with um, some exclusive uh, issues but there are states and states they have their exclusive power for example uh, we just saw election in the united states is determined by the states so the states they pass their own law for election, for to, uh, for casting votes, etc. Or another example, uh, marijuana. Marijuana uh, is a state criminal law in the U.S. is a state law because in some states marijuana is not a crime. The consumption or possession of marijuana is not a crime anymore, but in others it is still is. Um, capital punishment, the same thing, allowed in some states, not allowed in others. Here in Canada, so I told you, criminal law is exclusive power of the federal government. That's why it was the parliament who uh, passed law changing the criminal code, making possession uh, and conception of some quantity of marijuana not a criminal offense anymore some two or three years ago. Okay? Because it's federal uh, legislation. It's under the federal uh, power. Uh, and also, uh, I'm talking about provinces and federal government, and I didn't talk anything about municipalities. Well, the Constitution does not say anything about municipalities, powers of municipalities. So, uh, where do municipalities derive their power from? Uh, they derive their power from provincial legislation, provincial government. So municipalities, they are actually creation of the provinces, not creation of the federal government. And municipalities, they have laws. What kind of laws do they have? They are called bylaws. So uh, it's important to know that municipalities also pass law because there are some laws, some municipality laws, in other words, bylaws, that may affect the employment relationship. For example, smoking prohibitions. So it's not permitted to smoke indoor. And if an employee is smoking indoor, the employer uh, may be fined. The employee may be uh, warned, etc. But uh, the goal here is just to tell you that there are bylaws that may affect the employment relationship. So that's why it is important for us to know uh, that on the top of acts, statutes, constitution, charter of rights and freedoms, uh, 
case law, written law, uh, that are, there is also uh, by law that may affect the employment relationship. So that's a, a general overview on employment uh, legislation, not only employment legislation, but how laws are passed, how the legal system works in terms of legislation. So uh, the sources of legislation, how they are passed, uh, and also uh, where they come from. They may come from the province, they may come from the federal government or even municipalities, and also how they are interpreted. So some key employment statutes, and we will be discussing all of them, not in details, but we will be discussing them, parts of them, sections of those uh, statutes uh, throughout the course. So the Employment Standards Act, it is an act that deals with standards in employment legislation. It is there where we get the minimum wage, hours of work, vacation, leave, etc. We have the Human Rights Code, so dealing with human rights uh, situations, uh, abuses, infringements, Labor Relations Code, we'll also touch uh, upon this a little while when we discussed on unionized workplaces. And then in terms of uh, protection of health and safety, we have the Occupational Health and Safety Regulation, very important for us. We'll have a specific uh, chapter on it. Another chapter on the Workers' Compensation Act. So the priority is to avoid uh, any health or safety issues. However, even though uh, there may be a lot of work to avoid, uh, bad situations may happen. So in case they happen, uh, either the both the employer and the employee may rely on the workers' compensation. And also we'll look at the uh, Personal Information Protection Act because, as you know already, uh, privacy is a very important topic, not only in employment relationships, but in this uh, new world where uh, Google knows where we are, Apple knows uh, what we did, what we are listening to. Uh, so in this uh, digital world, uh, privacy has become very, very important. So we'll also be looking at privacy, uh, even though we'll be focusing on employment relationships when we do so. Uh, in terms of federal statutes, we will be dealing with some of them. Uh, in certain moments. So we'll look at the Canada Labor Code uh, that is applicable to uh, federally regulated employees and also the Canadian Human Rights. There's an Employment Equity Act in the federal level, not in BC yet. Uh, in terms of privacy, we have uh, PIPEDA, uh, the Personal Information Protection and Electronic Documents Act. And then Canada Pension Plan, so CPP, we have it detected in all our pay stubs, and also EI, Employment Insurance Act. So we'll be dealing with uh, all this legislation uh, throughout the course. Now let's look at the uh, Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. So this is important mainly because in employment relationships, there may be situations in which our rights and or freedoms may be violated, may be infringed. So that's why we need to uh, at least have read and have uh, discussed a little bit uh, about the Charter. So as I told you, uh, the Charter is part of the uh, Canadian Constitution. It was passed in 1982. So almost 40 years ago, uh, if I'm not, yeah, almost 40 years ago. And the Charter of Rights will deal with uh, several uh, uh, rights and freedoms, including equality rights. And equality rights, we'll see a section in a moment, but equality rights, we are talking about 
uh, equal legal rights. So if one is richer than the other, they will have equal rights. If the company is more powerful than the employee, but they should also have equal rights. Uh, so that's uh, a way to look at this uh, equality rights. So the charter is trying to protect uh, parties, uh, people, individuals in any given situation. And the charter also deals with freedom of religion. So you can uh, have your own religion or you can, you can decide not to have a religion and you cannot be discriminated for that. Uh, you also have a freedom to associate with others. So to create a union, to create a, a society, a group, uh, freedom of expression, so you can express uh, whatever you want. However, the freedom of expression is not an absolute right. And what I mean is that you can say whatever you want or write as long as what you say or write does not violate the right of others. So if you say that you don't like uh, this uh, law instructor, it's your opinion. It's fine. You have a freedom of expression. However, you cannot say, oh, this law instructor is an illegal uh, alien in Canada. Oh, this is wrong. This is false. And this may affect my reputation. Then you don't have freedom of, of expression to uh, lie, for example. So just keep that in mind. It's not the focus of uh, this uh, course, but it's important to uh, tell you that the freedom of expression is not absolute. It has limits, and the limits are related to rights of others. Okay? Uh, the Charter also uh, deals with democratic rights. So, in other words, this means there has to be, there has to be an election every uh, five years. Um, what else? Everyone can be voted. There may be some restrictions in terms of age. But still, if you are a Canadian citizen, you can vote. You may decide to vote. You may, you may decide to run for that election. So those are democratic rights. Mobility rights. So everyone has the right to go and come, to move provinces, to leave the country, come back to the country. Uh, we have some restrictions in our mobility, but I will use the example, this example uh, a little later. And legal rights. So we have some protections under the Charter. Uh, police cannot search us uh, just at random. They need to have a suspicion, uh, etc. So those are some of the legal rights. Or you can, if anyone can start a lawsuit if they believe they have uh, some of the rights were violated. So those are examples of legal rights. Uh, one thing that is important is that the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, they are only applicable with regards to governmental activity. So if I discriminate you, I as an individual, not as an, not as, uh, an instructor, as an individual, let's say I uh, meet you at uh, SkyTrain and I discriminate you. Let's say it uh, could be based on uh, your religion or uh, any, any other uh, ground of discrimination. So the charter would not be applicable in this situation. In this situation, the human rights code would be applicable because I am not the government and I am not performing any governmental uh, activity. However, when there's a governmental activity related to a discrimination, related to a violation of freedom or right, then the charter will be applicable. So let's say the provincial government puts out a job opening and they want to hire only men. So this uh, job posting clearly violates uh, gender. <clears throat> Uh, rights here and because it is the provincial government then the charter of rights and freedoms will apply okay 
when it's private uh, relationship, let's say a private company and a person in a similar situation, then it would be the human rights legislation, human rights code, not the Charter of Rights. And another important aspect here with the Charter of Rights and Freedoms is that all laws, so we, we just saw how laws are passed, statutes, acts, regulations, bylaws, so all this legislation, they have to be compliant with the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. So there can't be a legislation, a legislation that is contrary to the Charter. Because if it is, such legislation will may be challenged in court, and then that legislation cannot stand. That legislation will be uh, struck down by the courts. So the courts will say, hey, let's set aside this legislation, let's take it out, let's take this statute out. You either correct it to be compliant with the charter or take it out from the legal system because this leg legislation, the way it is, is not compliant with the charter. Okay, so that's another uh, aspect of the charter uh, that is important to note. Let's look at uh, one of the key provisions of the Charter, which is Section 15.1, uh, that deals with uh, equality. So every individual is equal before and under the law and has the right to equal protection and equal benefit of the law without discrimination, and in particular, without discrimination based on race, national or ethnic origin, color, religion, sex, age, or mental or physical disability. So those are all grounds of discrimination, as we call, that are in the Charter. We'll have a specific chap chapter for human rights legislation, which uh, has uh, similar grounds. Uh, they, they actually have a bit more. But uh, for now, let's focus, focus on the Charter. So the Charter does not allow any type of discrimination that would be based on either race, color, age, or any disability. Okay? So that's uh, how the equal, uh, equality uh, rights uh, should be read from the Charter. Again, you would only claim a protection from the charter if the alleged violation comes from a governmental entity or an entity that provides governmental service. Because as I said before, uh, the application of the charter requires an element of government activity. Okay, For private activity, then we will rely on the human rights uh, code or legislation. So this uh, is for you to think about, and I will bring it up during our live sessions. Uh, I want you to think about uh, this uh, question here based on this situation. So there's an omission of sexual orientation in the legislation. And do you think this omission uh, means a violation of the Charter? Uh, and if it is a violation, do you think uh, this act would be unconstitutional, would be not valid? So think about this, uh, and we'll, we will be um, discussing this in our uh, live session. So what is the uh, Charter's effect on employment law? <clears throat> The effect will be that any employment law that is allegedly uh, violating or infringing on our uh, charter rights and freedoms, they may be challenged in court. So we go to court and we say, hey, judge, this law is violating one or several of our uh, charter rights or freedoms. So will you please strike it down? Will you please take it out from the legal system? So 
the example here is uh, this case M versus H, in which a spouse was discriminated because the couple was same-sex partners. So in that law, a uh, spouse would only refer to uh, hetero uh, or yeah hetero or different uh, different gender uh, partners, not same sex or different sex partners, not same sex partners, and then the court uh, declared it uh, to be illegal because it violated. Uh, the equality right for sex, as we just saw. Uh, there are specific situations, however, in which the government is allowed to violate some of our rights and freedoms. But this will be the exception, because the general rule is that our rights and freedoms from the charter, they have to be protected, they have to be maintained. So whenever they are violated, they can only be under the exception nature. So section one of the charter says that an infringement is possible only when it's reasonable in a free and democratic society. So there's this famous uh, case, R versus Oaks. And by the way, when I'm referring to case, I am actually referring to one of the sources of law we saw in the very beginning. Common law based on written decisions of judges. So those cases, they are now used as source of law. So in M uh, versus H, Anyone who faces a discrimination because they uh, are in a same-sex relationship, they can refer to this case and challenge uh, such discrimination. In this other case, R versus Oaks, the Supreme Court determined that when there is a governmental objective that is pressing and substantial and that the means the government has chosen are proportional, and yet, the means are also connected to the objective. They also impair as little as possible. And the benefits of such violation or infringement outweigh the harmful effects, then such violation or infringement may stand. So what is a current example for this? A current example is, let's come back here. I told you that we have under the Charter Protection for Mobility Rights. We can go and come as we wish. However, if you are in BC now, we have a restriction order. We cannot go to other people's uh, houses, nor can we receive guests in our house. Oh, here we have an example of an order that is violating our charter rights. You may disagree with me, but I believe because of COVID-19, the spread is so fast, the seriousness of the disease, etc. I believe, but that's a personal uh, conclusion, that this infringement is reasonable in a free and democratic society. Because this limit is not forever. It was initially for two weeks, last November. And then it became uh, longer until uh, coming Friday, January 8th. It may be extended a little or even more, but it will not be forever. And the benefits, in principle, seem to outweigh the harmful effects. Okay? In any event, as I told you, this is my opinion, but in any event, anyone uh, who feels affected by this order in a negative way could challenge this order. Dr. Henry Bonny uh, bon orders uh, not to be able to 
have guests in their house. So they could challenge this in court, saying that this uh, violates, infringes their right, their mobility rights uh, under the charter. Okay? Uh, there's another exception uh, in the charter, uh, the notwithstanding clause, but this one has uh, been used in Canada only uh, two or three times, so uh, it's not uh, so important to mention here. Uh, what is important for us is to mention the exception, exception of Section 1, this reasonable limit in a free and democratic society, because this... Is, has been used by governments uh, a lot, uh, as the uh, health order I have just um, mentioned. So now we look at uh, common law uh, as the third uh, source I've, I've already uh, used. Uh, two cases, case laws as example. So common law is in other words, judge-made law. And this judge-made law uh, is also known to have a residual uh, value. Uh, well, statute law is what is going to be interpreted. And while you're interpreting statute law legislation, judges will render decisions. So we usually refer to uh, case law, because in that specific case law, there's an interpretation, uh, most likely based on a statute, on an act, that we need for our case. So, this is uh, the one of the main uh, key aspects of judge-made law, or case law. And case law, when they come from high courts, it could be the Court of Appeal in BC or the, court, or the Supreme Court of Canada. So decisions that come from those courts, they will set a precedent. <clears throat> so as I told you, the Supreme Court of Canada set a precedent in R versus Oaks uh, with regards to what is the required test for a uh, an act or an order that allegedly infringes the charter rights and freedoms but infringes it in a reasonable limit uh, in a free and democratic society so r versus oaks became a precedent meaning that all uh, limitations in the charter all infringements uh, based on the charter they will have to pass that uh, test. This is what a precedent is. And this precedent actually comes from the concept of stare decisis. Stare decisis is a Latin expression that means binding precedent. Binding precedent means that a precedent, in other words, a past case, is binding on some judges, on some courts. So, what I, what I told you a minute ago, decisions from the appeal court, not all, but some of them, and decisions from the Supreme Court of Canada, all the decisions, they set a precedent. And those precedents, they become binding on judges from lower courts. Let me give you an example. Uh, about 10 years, uh, I think it's about 10, 10 or a little bit more, but let's say 10 years ago, the Supreme Court of Canada decided that same-sex marriage was legal. That decision was rendered, was made by the Supreme Court of Canada. And this is a binding precedent. All judges, all over Canada, they have to apply this interpretation, this understanding, even if they disagree. But because this decision comes from the highest court in Canada, it is binding on other uh, courts. 
So we have this binding uh, precedent based on the stair the sizes principle. We also have precedents that are only persuasive. They are not binding. So if a precedent is only persuasive, the judge may decide to use it or not. So based on the facts, the judge may say, well, we are in Canada, but there's this decision in Australia that is applicable here in this given situation. I'm not bound by this decision, but I believe, but this decision persuaded me that it gives me a fair uh, judgment, a fair interpretation for my given case. So persuasive uh, precedents are precedents that are not binding, but they may be applicable at given situations in a way that the judgment is just, is fair. Uh, one other point I forgot, the binding um, precedents, the binding decisions, they have to come from higher courts and also they need to deal with this with similar facts of a given case. So again, the example I gave you uh, on same-sex marriage, any disputes related to same-sex marriage is similar to the decision of the Supreme Court. Uh, so, that precedent is binding. However, if there are facts that are different, then we call uh, it as a distinguishable precedent. So, a precedent that has different facts from a given situation. And in most cases, uh, distinguishable uh, precedents are not used or they are referred to but just to emphasize that those precedents could not be used uh, because the facts are not the same and sometimes but very few times it's very very rare uh, higher courts they may review case precedents they may review because they believe society has changed they may review because they believe values have changed. Uh, so for those precedents that were changed by higher courts, superior courts, we call them uh, watershed uh, decisions. But here, the two uh, most important ones will be the binding uh, precedent that come from higher courts with similar facts so judges from lower courts have to apply them. And the other one will be the persuasive one, uh, in which judges are not bound to apply them, but they may decide to use because they believe they are fair and just to the given situation they are working on. Okay, so um, we still have two other um, topics in contract law sorry, in employment law that are uh, important and they are contract law and tort law. So contract law is related to a contract, an agreement, and it, it should not be a surprise to you that an employment relationship is made out of a contract and whether it is verbal or written uh, we will learn in the future that uh, it is highly recommended to have a written employment agreement however let's say you went to a job interview this afternoon and the interviewer said oh i like you the job is yours can you start tomorrow yes yes i can how much will i get paid oh i'll pay you minimum wage oh okay i'm fine i, I get it so there's a contract. Oh, but I didn't sign anything. Well, a contract is not only a written paper. A contract is actually an agreement. And in this case, you had a verbal agreement. It is a verbal contract. Again, it is highly recommended to have an agreement in writing. And we'll see this throughout the course. But it doesn't mean that when you don't have a written piece of paper, related to 
uh, what you agreed to a company or to someone else, you don't have an agreement. No, you do have an agreement. So let's say you go you go buy um, a, a black coffee. You have an agreement. We usually don't come up come with a, a written piece of paper and give it to the cashier and say, "Hey, here's an agreement to buy coffee. Will you please sign it and give it to me and then uh, charge me on the coffee and give me the coffee?" We don't do this. So what I'm trying to convey here is that an agreement is not required to be in writing. There's only specific, some specific situations, such as the sale of a house, an apartment, real estate. It is required to, to have a written piece. But in general, contracts in general are not required to be in writing. And again, sorry to insist, but it doesn't mean you should not have it. It's highly recommended to have it in writing. Okay? So contract law is important for employment relationships because an employment relationship is formed out of a contract and also tort law. Tort law is a, a, a field of law that gives us an opportunity to uh, be compensated for losses we may have suffered. So examples of um, a tortious um, act will be defamation or even an assault or negligence. So those are situations, even in an employment situation, you may suffer defamation. So either your boss or other co-workers, they may uh, publish false uh, statements about yourself and you are not going to sue uh, under employment law. You will sue under tort law because tort law is the field of law that deals with uh, those civil wrongs, those uh, acts that allegedly cause harm to others, sorry, not harm, but um, loss to others, and such loss uh, has to be uh, compensated. Okay, so we'll be dealing with those uh, two areas as well uh, as we move uh, through the, the course. <clears throat> And now uh, we look at the uh, court system in Canada. So the way you have to understand the court system, uh, I'm going to share um, another page here with you. You should have this. Uh, let me just adjust here. You should have this as a handout. And in that uh, slide, you have the uh, explanation in words. So the Supreme Court of Canada is the highest court in the country. In other words, all decisions from the Supreme Court of Canada will become a binding precedent. So all judges all over the country will have to follow precedents that are set by the Supreme Court of Canada. And then I will not focus on the military, uh, military courts not in the federal courts either. I want to call our attention here for the provincial courts. So uh, I'm not sure I can uh, draw here. No, I don't think I can draw. But the way you should look is that all provinces will have a system like this. They will have the court of appeal of a province. So the Court of Appeal of each province will be the highest court within that province. And then they will have a superior court and a provincial court. So those are lower than the Court of Appeal. So let me say this again. Supreme Court of Canada is the highest court in the country. And then within each province there will be a court of appeal of that province so we have the court of appeal of bc and that is the highest court in the province and then we have two lower courts one will be the superior court and the other the provincial court in bc 
the superior court is called the BC Supreme Court. But please do not confuse this one with the Supreme Court of Canada. They are different. Okay. So the Supreme Court of BC is the superior court in BC. But the superior court is still lower than the court of appeal because the court of appeal is the highest one. And the provincial court is the lowest level. And we also have administrative tribunals. Why do we have administrative tribunals? Well, uh, the parliament or the legislature, they decided that some topics of law, some issues, would be better dealt with by specialized tribunals rather than the court system. So for employment, which is our case, there's an administrative tribunal. So whenever we have employment uh, issues, we file a complaint in the employment branch. We do not file a lawsuit. Another example is human rights. There's the Human Rights Tribunal. So whenever we have an issue with discrimination, for example, we will file a complaint with the Administrative Tribunal, the Human Rights Tribunal. Whereas if you um, are involved in a criminal issue, family issue, civil issue, then you are going to use the court system. Okay, some decisions from the administrative tribunals, they may be reviewed by the courts, but only some. Okay, I will detail this as we uh, move forward uh, with the course. So now coming back to the slide, I told you that the Supreme Court of Canada is the highest court in the country. And then within each province, the highest court will be the Court of Appeal. And then lower than the Court of Appeal will be the Superior Court. In BC, this court is, is called the BC Supreme Court. And then lower than the Superior Court, we have the Provincial Court. And here in BC, the Provincial Court, we have the small claims. So if you have issues up to $35,000, you use the small claims, you don't need to hire a lawyer, so the procedure is easier, is smoother. Also for less serious offenses, less serious, uh, sorry, criminal offenses, uh, the jurisdiction, the authority is with the provincial court, not with the superior court. The superior court will deal with most serious criminal offenses, uh, with situations in which the monetary amount is over 35,000 uh, and others, okay? And then we have the administrative tribunals. As I told you, uh, most employment statutes, they will be administered by those um, administrative tribunals. Uh, we can also call boards, so specialized boards. And they will be the ones interpreting and enforcing the statutes. They will be the ones making decisions as well. So we'll see this in more details and also in application, in real application, uh, as we move uh, through the course. But it's very uh, important to understand the court system because uh, you understand how the law works, how the law is applied, and now you understand where the law will be applied. Uh, with the court system. By the way, the administrative tribunals, they are not part of the court system. They are part of the uh, executive body, but the, the statutes that uh, determine them uh, give them authority to interpret and also render decisions. So the last uh, slide is just is just uh, related to how we locate employment laws. So for federal law, we should go to this uh, Department of Justice website. There's also Canley. Canley will have uh, 
the vast majority, if not all, case law in Canada. Uh, we could also go to uh, the bclaws.ca for BC legislation. And even though our textbook has Alberta and BC employment laws, we'll be focusing only on BC laws when we talk about uh, provinces, not Alberta. Okay? And we can also locate uh, employment law in other uh, textbooks, also in uh, newsletters uh, that are newsletter services, um, etc. Uh, articles, we can Google, etc. So that's the end of uh, chapter one, this overview of employment law. And we'll be back with chapter two. Thank you.